This lecture is devoted to the proof of Harold Cremier's large deviation theorem associated to the strong law of large numbers in its standard form. If xn is a sequence of iid exponentially integrable random variables, then the probability that the centered sum of those random variables exceeds n times any positive parameter epsilon is precisely exponentially small in n. That is, the log of that probability divided by n has a limit, and that limit is exactly equal to the negative of the Legendre transform of the cumulant generating function of the underlying centered distribution of the random variables at the parameter epsilon. And that quantity is non-positive, and in fact strictly negative for all sufficiently large epsilon. We have already proved the upper bound part of this theorem, and so we now need to show the much trickier statement that the liminf of 1 over n times that log probability is greater than or equal to that same bound. Now for the sake of readability throughout this proof, we will drop the explicit dependence of the analytic transforms on the random variable x1 centered, and instead refer to them as just psi, the Legendre transform as just psi star, and the moment generating function just as m. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the definition of the Legendre transform and its nice properties in this special case. Since psi is the log moment generating function in this exponentially integrable case, we know that it is a smooth, in fact, real analytic function, and that it is convex, as we showed last time. Now that means that the Legendre transform, which is defined to be this supremum, and we know can be taken just over the non-negative reals, is actually a maximum achieved at some point. It may not be unique, there can be more than one maximizer, the function isn't necessarily strictly convex, but there will be a maximizer in the positive real line where this supremum is achieved. And from calculus, that maximizer will occur at a critical point. So let's write down the critical equation. We need this derivative to be zero at the maximizer, and that just gives us eta minus psi prime at that maximizer. In other words, the maximizer satisfies that the derivative of psi at that maximizer is equal to the parameter eta, which will be epsilon for us. In a moment, we're going to give probabilistic interpretation to this statement. To see how, let's remind ourselves of a nice trick, a change of measure that came in handy in the previous lecture. If y is any exponentially integrable random variable on a probability space, omega fp, then for each real number t, we can define a new probability measure pt on the same measure space, which just has a density with respect to the old probability measure, this density here, e to the ty divided by the moment generating function of y. Just to belabor the point here, let's note that this is a non-negative, clearly measurable function. And if I integrate that putative probability measure over the whole space, that's the integral of e to the ty divided by m of t against the original probability measure p, we can pull out the moment generating function m of t, and we're left with the integral of e to the ty dp, but that's just the expected value of e to the ty, which is the definition of the moment generating function, and so we do indeed see that this is a probability measure for each t. Now in the proof of Cremier's theorem that we're about to present, we're going to sample from this probability measure pt, where t is chosen to be that maximizer. And the maximizer equation therefore gives us some information about the mean of those samples. So let's delve into the proof. We're going to show that the liminf of 1 over n times the log probability that the centered sum of the original random variables exceeds n times epsilon is greater than or equal to this bound. And remember, that means we're showing that it is greater than or equal to this precise value here, where t epsilon is a maximizer for the supremum that defines the Legendre transform, which is defined by this equation here. Well, let's compute that derivative. Remember, the cumulant generating function is the log of the moment generating function. And so that's just m prime over m. And if we take that derivative inside the expected value, we have 
the expected value of x1 centered, e to the tx1 centered, divided by m. And now we can bring that m inside, and we have the density of the probability measure pt. So that derivative at t is nothing other than the expected value with respect to the changed probability measure pt of the original centered random variable, say, x1. And so t being a maximizer is the statement that that expected value is equal to epsilon. Now this is very suggestive that the problem is better adapted to the law of x1 under this changed probability measure than under the original one. And so let's go ahead and make that change of variables. That is, instead of considering the original sequence of random variables xn, let's consider a sequence wn of iid random variables whose common law is the push forward of the probability measure pt under x1 centered, or xn centered, if we prefer. That is to say, the law of wn under the probability measure p is defined to be the law of x1 centered under the probability measure pt. Now from there it follows immediately that the expected value of wn under p is the same as the expected value of x1 circ under pt. We calculate on the last slide that that's equal to epsilon. And so there's our probabilistic interpretation of that critical equation. It's a statement that epsilon is the expected value of these random variables wn. Now we can say more than that about their law. We can write down a formula for that law in terms of the law of the original x's quite easily. If I take the law of wn at some Borel set in the real line, that's defined to be the pt probability that x1 circ is in b. From the definition of pt, that's the integral over the pre-image of b under x1 circ of e to the t x1 circ divided by m of t dp. And now, by a change of variables with respect to the law of x1 circ, that's equal to the integral over b of the function e to the t little x divided by m of t times the law with respect to the original probability measure p of x1 circ. That is to say, we have that the random variable wn has a law that has a density, this exponential density, with respect to the original x1 circ's law. But this is a strictly positive function, and so that means that this law has a density with respect to this one, just given by the reciprocal of that strictly positive density. And so we can write the law of x1 centered in terms of the law of wn. How is that going to be useful? Well, that means that we can write expected values of functionals of the x's in terms of expected values of related functionals of the w's. In particular, if f is any measurable, non-negative, potentially infinite valued function of n variables, then the expected value of f of the first n centered original random variables x1 through xn can be written as, from their change of variables, the integral of f against the product measure of the x's because they are iid. And now, using this density result here, we can write this instead as the product measure of the laws of the w's with this exponential factor. Now employing the change of variables for the w random variables, this gives us this formula. Now how does this help us? We're interested in probabilities of events that involve the sum of these random variables. So we're going to take f to be the indicator that the sum of these is bigger than n times epsilon. But that means that we can rewrite the probability we're interested in on this side in terms of the w variables, and in fact in terms of their sum, which is already sitting nicely there in the exponent. So to be precise, we now apply this result in the case where f is given by this Borel function here. This expectation then simply becomes the probability that Sn circ is bigger than n times epsilon, which we're trying to bound below, and therefore that is equal to m of t to the n times the expected value of e to the minus t times t 
Tn, the sum of the Wn's, times the indicator of the event that Tn is bigger than n times epsilon. Now remember, we want to bound this below. And so we'd like to see an event contained in this event that will nevertheless help us bound this. Well, that event is going to be the event that Tn is bounded below by n times epsilon and bounded above by n times something bigger than epsilon. Let's call it epsilon plus delta for any chosen delta bigger than zero. That event is contained in the event that Tn is bigger than n times epsilon. And so the indicator function here is bigger than or equal to that restricted indicator function. Now, if I take the expected value of this instead, that means that I can only decrease this probability, which is what I wanted. I wanted a lower bound. But on the event that Tn is less than or equal to n times epsilon plus delta, e to the minus t times Tn is greater than or equal to e to the minus t times that number. And so combining those together, I see that I have a lower bound for this probability, just given by the moment generating function to the power n, e to the minus Tn times epsilon plus delta times the expected value of this indicator function, which is the probability that n epsilon is less than or equal to Tn is less than or equal to n epsilon plus delta. Now, as we did in the previous lecture, we're going to write the moment generating function as the exponential of the cumulant generating function and combine terms here. e to the n times psi of t will combine with e to the minus nt times epsilon. We're going to leave that exponential t and delta out. And what we get is this. And now remember that our goal is to take t equal to the maximizer that gives us the definition of the Legendre transform. And so taking t equal to t epsilon and everything above, this becomes the negative of the Legendre transform at epsilon. And so this is given by this. Now remember what our goal was. Our goal was to show that 1 over n times the log of that is greater than or equal to 1 over n times the log of that. And so we will have achieved that goal as long as we can show that this stuff goes to 0 after taking the log and dividing by n. That is, the liminf of 1 over n times the log of the probability in question is greater than or equal to what we want, minus the log of this, which is just t epsilon times delta, plus this term here, 1 over n times the log of that probability. Now, let's ignore that term for the time being. If we didn't have that there, then we'd certainly be done, because we've shown this for every delta positive, and so if I just take delta down to 0, I get the lower bound that I'm interested in. And so in order to make that conclusion, all I need to do is show that this limit is 0. Well, to prove that, we're going to have to flash forward a little bit and use a theorem that is actually on our docket to prove in the next few weeks, but which you certainly already know, the central limit theorem. Here's the idea. To handle this term here, we note, as we calculated at the beginning of this proof, that the summands wn and tn all have expected value epsilon. And that means that the expected value of tn is this n times epsilon. Thus, we should really write this probability that we're trying to logarithmically bound as the probability that 0 is less than or equal to Tn minus n times epsilon, and that that is less than or equal to just n times delta, which is the same thing as the probability that the centered Tn is between 0 and n times delta. Now, Tn centered is a sum of iid centered random variables, so this looks like something maybe that the strong law of large numbers should apply to. But we're not talking about convergence of that random variable in some sense. We're talking about the probability that it takes values in an interval that grows with n. And so even if we divide by n here, we're still going to have a macroscopic integral we need to deal with. So that's outside what the strong law of large numbers can talk about. It is in the realm of what the central limit theorem can talk about. The central limit theorem tells us that if I take that centered sum of independent identically distributed random variables 
and I standardize it, meaning I divide by its standard deviation, which by the independence is equal to the square root of n times their common variance, then that random variable converges in distribution to a standard normal. We're going to get to precisely what that means later, but in our context, it particularly means that the probability that that standardized sum is greater than or equal to zero converges as n goes to infinity to the probability that a standard normal is greater than or equal to zero, which is precisely equal to one half. Well, that helps us out here because the probability we have to deal with could be rewritten by dividing through by this standard deviation as the probability that zero is less than or equal to standardized Tn, and that that is less than or equal to the square root of n over the common variance of the w's times delta. Now, those w's are not constant, so the variance is not going to be zero in the denominator, no problem there. And for any positive delta, this is going to go off to infinity. And so by a simple continuity argument for probability measures, as n goes to infinity, this is going to converge to the probability that this is between zero and infinity which converges to one half. That shows that the log here converges to the log of one half, which is not negative infinity. And therefore, dividing by n, the limit is zero, and we have concluded the proof of Cremier's large deviation principle. Now, just a word to comfort you if you're concerned about circularity, we will prove the central limit theorem relatively soon, and the proof will not in any way rely on Cremier's theorem or anything we've discussed in the last few lectures. Thus, we have now seen precisely how rare this event related to the strong law of large numbers is. It is exactly exponentially small with an exponential rate given by this rate function. There is your first taste of a large deviation principle. We're going to continue our discussion in the next lectures of rare events, but from a different perspective. We're going to prove what is sometimes called the law of rare events, which is another kind of limit theorem. And in order to get there, we need to talk about some new kinds of convergence of random variables and their probability distributions. So our next topic is total variation.